Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Fast Data Choices, Five Steps for Evaluating Alternative Business and Technology Options. Uh, before we begin, I want to talk about a few housekeeping items. This is a live presentation with ON24. There are a lot of people on the call uh, and you may experience a slight delay a second or two when we advance slides. Uh, also, everybody should know there will be an archived version of the presentation available in a few days. Everyone will get um, an email uh, with a link to the replay. The phone lines are muted, but that doesn't mean we don't want your questions and participation. We do. Please use the uh, Q&A window on your screens to enter questions as we go along. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end. We'd encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter. Click the Twitter icon on the bottom of your screen or use the hashtag VoltDBFastData. Also, you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, we've loaded up some resources. There's a resources window where you can download VoltDB if you want to try it out. You can review the other two webinars in this series, and you can download our ebook. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, I wanted to introduce uh, Mike Bowen, who's joining us from Full360. Full360 Full is a VoltDB partner. They're system integrators for managed services. They talk about themselves as being data guys focused on the cloud. Mike is a database veteran. He's got over 25 years of experience in all, all aspects of building decision support applications. He started out at, at Xerox, and he's got hands-on experience through four generations of technology. In his current role at Full360, he's responsible for building managed services for next generation AWS cloud-based high-performance data architectures. His focus is on migrations and greenfield implementations of near real-time data warehouses using next-gen methodologies including data management optimization, virtual orchestration, and parallelized ELT across columnar, in-memory, shardable databases. He's a father of three. He lives in Southern California with his wife of 22 years. Also with us today is Dennis Duckworth. Dennis is Director of Product Marketing here at VoltDB, uh, where he helps companies extract real business value from their fast data. He holds a degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. And just prior to joining VoltDB, he spent year, uh, eight years at uh, Netiza and IBM as the head of product marketing. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike and Dennis. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so here we are on the third installment of this executive webinar series, and I know that a large number of you uh, registered for the previous webinars, and I'm not sure if you attended them. So I thought I'd take a little time and present some of the highlights from those sessions, particularly ones that are pertinent for us today. So first up, we had Bruce Redding, our CEO here at VoltDB, and David Peters, Peters CEO of Imagine International. Uh, and they explained four steps to expand your window of opportunity while avoiding risky options when exploring fast data use cases. And just as a reminder, in case you want to go back and watch this in the resources uh, area of your screen, you'll have a link to, to that particular webinar and the second one. Don't do, go explore that yet. Stick with us, and uh, you can explore that later on. Um, during that webinar, we heard uh, Bruce and Dave talk about the need for fast data in what Dave called real-time event decisioning. That is, deciding during an interaction with a customer exactly how to interact with them, what to say, what to do, what offer to give, etc. All of that needs to happen exactly then, not 10 minutes later or even 10 seconds later. Dave also talked about the strict requirements for their solution and their search for a real-time database that could support their real-time event decisioning through their implementation of a Lambda architecture, speeds of sub-250 millisecond response times, and scaling to millions of transactions per second were, are key, were key requirements for Dave and Imagine. During the next uh, uh, series uh, webinar, uh, episode of the webinar, we had Niall Norton, CEO of OpenNet, and our very own Peter Vescuso talk about how innovative companies in mobile telco, financial services, media and entertainment, and Internet of Things have successfully tapped into the fast data opportunity. Niall presented uh, 
now present the need at OpenNet for smarter engagement with customers, very similar to Imagine's need. Now called it becoming more relevant to your customers. Now, who doesn't strive to be more relevant to their customers? He also talked about how real-time data is a key enabler of that increased relevance with highly personalized, contextually aware offers. And I just love the way that he closed with a quote from that great statesman, Mike Tyson, summing up uh, with how telcos and all companies really are being driven to change and how fast data, is an, fast data is an enabler for that change. So now we're all caught up and we're starting our third installment here and we're gonna talk about some practical steps companies can take to discover how fast data can help them be more relevant to their customers or their partners or even their own employees, and how fast data can help them be more agile and to change more quickly and easily. We have written a strategy guide on some of the best practices we've discovered or uncovered when we've been working with our customers in defining fast use cases and, and projects and evaluating different solution options. We've extracted some of the key points to present to you today. All attendees of this webinar will be receiving a copy of that strategy guide, by the way, through follow-up email, so keep an eye open for that. And if this presentation or if this, the strategy guide spark an interest and you would like to have a conversation about this topic, we at VoltDB and I'm sure Mike and his team at Full360 will be happy to have that conversation with you. So these are the steps that I chose to talk about today. This is certainly not an exhaustive or comprehensive list but it represents more of some low-hanging fruit for you in your, in your consideration of fast data in your particular business. People often ask us about the difference between big data and fast data. Big data has been all the rage for the past few years, volume, variety, velocity, along with several other Vs that are sometimes cited as being defining characteristics of big data. What I have found is that the velocity V often gets the short end of the stick in big data projects. Customers take the big and go out and build a huge data lake on Hadoop or try to modernize their data warehouse, adding complex mm -hmm. ETL tools to try to merge structured and unstructured data for the data scientists to tap into. The velocity piece for them more typically means just being able to accept and store data as it's coming at them very quickly, storing it away for some future action. Fast data and fast data applications for us mean there is a need for some kind of action very quickly in response to some incoming data. This isn't just a lookup, a simple lookup of data. There are lots of tools that can do that, but rather some per event or per customer action is needed. That is where the real-time transaction ability of VaultDB really shines. So the first step is all about identifying a fast data opportunity for you and your company. There are likely at least a few, maybe even lots of options that are available. Having a brainstorming session with your team to pull together a list of candidates is usually the first uh, best step. This needs to be a real business value opportunity that can be returned in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable financial investment. I've seen many big data projects fail for that reason. A team was tasked by some executive to go do a big data project. The need was never well defined and so success could never be determined or measured. Fast data projects tend to be more operational in nature, so defining the business value is usually much easier. A little more about team. It's critical to have both business and technical teams contribute equally on fast data projects. This isn't going to be a case where business decides what needs to be done, tosses it over the wall to the technical team, and let's just call us when it's done. There are key decisions that need to be made throughout the process, and the business and technical teams need to work closely and regularly together. We've seen business come up with some doozies of projects maybe even impossible goals for a, for a project, mostly because the technical team was left out of the conversation. Likewise, we've seen some te technical teams dream up some amazingly complex, fragile, and expensive solutions simply because they wanted to use some cool new open source software because they really wanted to work at LinkedIn or Facebook and they thought software that those disruptors used was really keen. So that's not the way to go. Working together as a team will help you through those uh, uh, possible issues. Now this is an important point, assessing existing infrastructure. New projects may need new software products, but likely there are components that are working well within your company that would continue to work well as part of this new project. 
corporate standards are sometimes there to help you guide uh, guide you in this area, but sometimes those corporate standards are sacred for no good reason, and they should be jettisoned. And there are some new solutions out there that claim to be the best at many things, sort of like Shimmer Floor Wax from Saturday Night Live. It's a floor wax. No, it's a dessert toppy. No, wait, it's both. Don't buy into that claim that you need to get rid of a perfectly good working component, maybe your working data at warehouse, for the sake of simplifying your environment. That could be one step too far, introducing unnecessary risk, delay, and expense. There's a lot to getting agreement on your success criteria. I won't spend a lot of time on it here, but an important point is just document everything as you go through this process. It's easy to forget in the heat of battle what was important to you originally. You will certainly discover new things when you're going through this endeavor, but be mindful about changing tax midstream. It's, it's very expensive, very costly from other perspectives such as time and impact on the business. Understanding the business and technical implications. Uh, the first few of these have, are, are very important, but we covered them pretty well in the previous two webinars. Uh, are you solving an analytics problem or a transactional problem? Uh, is this a real-time problem or can it be solved with batch? Is data in integrity important? Is having correct data in real time a must-have, a nice-have, or, or who, who, who the heck needs it? Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on those, so I want to concentrate on the latter part of this list uh, for this page. Uh, open source do-it-yourself stacks are crazed now. You've got Kafka, Storm, Cassandra, Zookeeper. And so the question of whether to use commercial software or free open source software, or FOSS as it's sometimes called, is a, is a great question to start with. Many commercial or enterprise software products offer an open source version, either from the vendor themselves or from GitHub, so it's easy to try out both. Uh, you have to keep in, uh, keep in mind what's being offered with that commercial version. Typically support is included and support can be a very critical factor when you move to production. Uh, keep in mind if you choose to go the Apache stack route that if you do so, you'll become a software development and DevOps company in addition to being a financial institution or a telco or an ad tech company or whatever you may be. There are lots of clusters to maintain and upgrade, lots of glue code to write and debug, lots of different failure mechanisms and scenarios to test against and code up fixes and graceful recoveries for. Speaking of complexity, as I alluded to before, there are lots of companies out there trying to sell you all-in-one products. We've learned from our customers that they tend to represent a compromise. They may be able to do multiple things, but generally they do all those things poorly. I've had experience in that, and you may have too, if you've ever tried to implement Oracle Exadata or SAP HANA. And if you want to hear some of my war stories about Exadata, feel free to ping me afterwards. I'll be happy to go on hours about that. Regarding the cloud, um, most software these days is cloud ready. Bolt DB can be run on your own cluster of commodity servers or any of the cloud vendors. We see many companies that used to insist on everything running in their own data centers be quite open and even eager to put new workloads in the cloud and to migrate existing workloads there as well. BoltDB has posted some Yahoo cloud serving benchmark YCSB data to show comparisons of us running on SoftLayer, Google, and Amazon. All were really fast. Mike and Full360 are true cloud experts, so I'm sure he'll have more to say on that topic later on. You may want to consider a hybrid cloud model. I've talked to banks, for example, who want to have a cloud-based application, a system of engagement, if you will, that's augmented by data from on-premises systems. These are usually transactional systems with very pers uh, sensitive personal data that they aren't quite ready to put out on a public cloud yet. Sometimes they call this a private cloud or hybrid cloud on-premises solution. So your mileage may vary there. A question of semantics maybe, but I advise customers to create prototypes rather than proofs of concept. From my experience working with proofs of concept, uh, they tend to be limited in terms of long-term value, they waste time, they're easy to gain by the vendors, and they don't necessarily contribute to an end goal. Whereas after a successful prototyping exercise, you actually have something tangible, something that is the basis for a real application or set of applications. You may be tempted to try head-to-head -head prototyping of multiple different products or multiple different vendors against each other. Usually you call it a head-to-head -head POC. And that's very tempting and certainly can be very entertaining. But it also takes considerable effort in terms of coordination, freeing up your team's time, and it may not necessarily be conclusive. 
those crack POC teams that descend on your company uh, usually know exactly how to make their software hung, uh, sing for any particular use case. They know all the tricks, but unfortunately you don't. Uh, I've often been asked about what role vendors should play in your evaluation process or your prototyping process. How much should they be involved? If you know and trust a vendor, it can be a great idea to actually get them involved much earlier in the process, even in helping you figure out the particular use cases and project. These vendors have a lot of experience in their field across a wide spectrum of industries and use cases. Sometimes their experience combined with their fresh eyes on your own business can reveal some areas that would benefit that you normally would not see. I suggest you consider the vendors at, at the minimum paid consultants that you can use to answer questions or help you get through rough spots. But I think you and your team should do all the work. You are choosing a product you will need to live with after the, that crack POC team from the vendor leaves. And you may have to make sure that you are comfortable with using that product without them or else have a very hefty professional services budget set aside just in case you have to call them again. If you choose wisely, you'll want to use this product for other applications too, and the vendor may be less available or less motivated to help. On the other hand, I would highly recommend that you do not attempt to prototype a product completely independently without a vendor being involved. Each product has its own quirks, and without the vendor talking you through them, you might just eliminate a candidate for some very insignificant reason. User interfaces and tools sometimes fall in that area. If you are unfamiliar uh, with the tools and, and user interface for a particular vendor, you might be tempted to go with a product with a slick cool tool or a slick cool front end, only later to find out that the vendor really should have spent more time and engineering effort and money on the main software and less on the tools. So that's enough for the suggestions for right now. I'm going to turn it over to Mike now for his insights from Full360. Mike? Thanks, Dennis. Um, I'm going to talk about fast data uh, with Full360 and our experiences with VoltDB. I have uh, three uh, case studies to present to you, and each one will give you a little bit of a uh, different aspect of what we've been doing. Uh, but first, let me uh, introduce you to Full360. Um, <clears throat> we are data warehouse guys uh, focused on building analytic applications. And that traditionally has put us uh, from a Wall Street background doing data warehouse, uh, business intelligence, FinApps, of that sort, because those are the ones that have the highest requirements for accuracy of data. And we've been through, uh, me as a family consultant around the states and, and Europe, seeing the limits of IT in the enterprise space and the dominance of particular vendors in that, limiting the choices that are available. And we said, well, what if we built mydatawarehouse.com? And I'm a DBA and I'm an architect. What would I want when I could build anything I wanted and use the best tool for anything that my customer comes up with? And so uh, we took that opportunity in 2007, became an Amazon partner uh, uh, with their, uh, as an integrator. And now we've come up with some really cool things. We've got a lot of good customers which uh, have presented us with some interesting challenges. And we discovered there's more to data warehousing than has ever been before. And part of that is, you know, the big data explosion that everybody talks about. Uh, but what we kind of decided is we're going to use multiple databases uh, that solve problems. So that's very rare uh, where you have a fast database, a big data database, and other capabilities. And so we have evolved a data management platform that's going to be next generation. So we've taken DevOps practices. We look forward to uh, Internet of Things, and we're just kind of taking it to the next generation beyond what uh, Kimball ever dreamed of. And so we call that multi-tier data warehouse. And we're a managed service. So we will build and design for you and then locate it in the cloud uh, and, and then just save you the headache of dealing with updates and all that kind of stuff. And we do the right mix of open source and proprietary uh, stacks. So it's really cool. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about wide data, we're talking about data models that are expanded beyond what has been possible before. For example, we did some aviation stuff where we correlated uh, a weather database with a fuel consumption database of aircraft. And nobody had ever put those two things together to find out when you're taking off and landing in, in different kinds of weather, do you consume more fuel? Or when the pilots ask for more fuel, are they really justified? So 
we are expanding on a lot of legacy systems and getting really cool things. And of course, the near real-time component is a part of our platform as well, and that's why we're working with VoltDB. Let's talk about these three case studies, and each one is kind of unique. Um, when we talk about um, our, our, my first example is going to be fairly simple and straightforward, and it's what we typically thought about. It, it's one that we did a couple of years ago, uh, earlier on uh, in our experience, and it's kind of clear this is, this is a kind of fast data application. And it, it's kind of obvious there. The second one is one that we just finished the prototype uh, for, and we've got the go-ahead to make this really big. And it represents a little bit of a change in our thinking about um, the transaction end of data warehouse and data platform. Uh, so that one's really cool. It's a little bit more complicated, uh, so I'll spend some time on that. And then the third one is one that we've done, and it has implications in the industry, and I think it's going to, it's going to be a, a common sense, but then you think about it and you say, oh, wow, I never thought about it that way, and it changes, I think, what's possible uh, in the industry. So uh, let, me, let me get on uh, to that. For online gaming, we came engaged with this customer that does online gaming, and they're not uh, like an Xbox or a PS4 console or a PC gamer. They're more of what I would call grandma games. So you can imagine games that your grandmother likes to play, bingo, Wheel of Fortune, Solitaire, Slots, Tic-Tac-Toe, that kind of stuff online. And these are mostly on a free app on Android. So grandma needs the bigger Android phone. And we decided uh, that we would engage with them. And they have a real-time economy. So the, their, their gamers are playing with chips, and they're spending chips, and they're buying chips, and they're switching between games. And so we, did, we built an analytic application for them that was real time. And what they wanted to do is see the state of their whole application right now. What just happened? Who is, who is doing what in this application? And so that was the, the need for this was to not do this in batch, but to do this in real time. So it's a pretty clear case for VoltDB. <clears throat> what we discovered was that they had about 95 different game events where they decided at first there were about 50 or 60, and they, they ran out of space in their old technology platform of how they could add more events to that. And so what we did is we got together with them, and we said, well, one of the great things about VoltDB is it has these Java classes that we can extend. And so we put together a tool that helped them rapidly prototype these extensions to uh, VoltDB so they could ingest the real-time events as they were coming through. So it was a combination of Java and SQL, commodity languages where people have tens of years of experience, and so it made that application a little bit more easy to maintain. And then we were able to compile those together with stored procedures with the database, have that whole thing running in memory and ready to chug through these uh, events happening in real time on a worldwide uh, uh, basis because they're talking to the CDNs and the CDNs are talking to the game engine. And we are intercepting those events as they happen in real time and giving these, uh, the, the, the gaming company a, a, a real insight into what's going on. Now, it turns out, since we do cloud, we talk about cloud instances, which are basically servers. And in the AWS world, an M1X large is about a four-way Linux box. It's your standard four-way server. So we put together a cluster of these two, and they're humming along just easy. They're case safe, uh, so they're replicated, and we don't have to worry about anything. We have never had any problems with this application, and it's doing 30,000 trans transactions per second. So that's a global game, all these folks doing, pulling slot levers and winning or losing chips, and we're keeping track of that. That turns out to about 9 million records a day, uh, transaction-wise, which is uh, three, point, uh, three and a quarter billion transactions per year. Now, if you come from our background in, uh, with financials, you're talking about P&Ls and, and balance sheets and that kind of stuff for every kind of industry. You never see these kinds of numbers. So it's exciting for us as data warehouse folks who, are, who, who come up with the OLAP world to get this kind of volume of atomic data into our analytic models. 
And just to give you a comparison, if you talk about PayPal, last year PayPal did $4.9 billion, about $5 billion transactions, only 28% of which were from sourced from mobile. So we're doing as much mobile transactions in this one application for online gaming as PayPal does globally. So that was really exciting to us. We're saying, oh, we have a whole lot more power. And when we thought about putting together our data warehouse platform in the cloud, yeah, we were thinking about horizontal scaling, but we really didn't expect that we would get this kind of transaction data. So it opened up a world for us, and when people start talking about refrigerators and, and toasters talking, we're saying, bring it on. We've got VoltDB. We're ready for this kind of stuff. So we started building our, our platform, and it requires a little bit of background, but here's the analogy. What we really want to do is change what ETL is. So we have these workflow processes, and we're saying, how are we going to deal with these huge volumes? And what we came up with is we thought about the new languages. We thought about Go, and we decided on Scala as a language that does parallelism very well. And it does a kind of auto-scaling of instances, and, and, and you can send it out like a swarm of bees that collect honey uh, uh, or pollen from a field of things. So you have this massive parallelization, and then Scala as a language auto-coordinates those bees and makes sure as they come in in the right order. So it's an extraordinary thing that preserves uh, uh, order when you're counting things, and you need to know that. But we said, can we do this for everything? And, and, and we do theoretically. But for this particular application, we decided to use VoltDB to help do that uh, uh, transaction processing. So this is a member fulfillment application. And there's a stream of data that's involved, and it's massively parallel, and it's for uh, 11 million frequent flyers. So Imagine the situation where um, <clears throat> you want to set out a promotional template based on some criteria that the marketing people come up with. And so we are replacing a core technology in this frequent flyer infrastructure that allows to uh, fulfill these things. Uh, another example is several years ago, I worked uh, at a company called Axiom out of Conway, Arkansas. And their job was to do fulfillment. Uh, and fulfillment basically means let's try some criteria uh, for Citibank. We have 2 million card members. Give them the whole list and try these criteria. And we want to offer only 50,000 cards. So find a mix of this demographic or this attribute of customers. And they, they hooked together at Axiom the best computers they had. And they ran them overnight or maybe for two days to sort through all of those things and then give a list of, of mail merge to send out to their customers. We're doing this on the scale of millions in a matter of seconds. So this gives a, a possibility of real time, whatever event is decided by, by the, uh, the, the airline, to do a fulfillment across their, their frequent flyers, they can do that now. So really cool. Out to uh, the, the output is going to go to mobile apps. So this is something we said, well, we can stream a lot of this information. This is a fancy state diagram that's part of that. You can think of it as a black box. We set it up with Amazon Simple Queue Service, and we said there's going to be a, a queue request that comes in and a set of fulfillments that go out. We'll take this HTML template. We'll fill in the information according to the information that we have on the customer, and they'll go. And so as we did our prototyping, we said, well, we'll do the zero case or the one case, and that's imperceptibly fast. We'll do a, a, a few small. We'll do maybe a 1,000, and that was sub-second. And then we'll do the full case. And on this one, when you, when you do what we, we consider a broadcast, where every, every uh, frequent flyer member gets this fulfillment, and that's the infinite case. We got 4 million, just about 4 million in under 30 seconds. And so we could make a snap decision 
and in marketing push out a pre-existing template up to 4 KB to millions of mobile devices that quickly. We did this on a single, this is a four-way general purpose four-way server in Amazon. And when we originally did the prototyping, we said, well, maybe we'll do this with uh, Amazon's equivalent of NoSQL, which is DynamoDB. And you'd have to turn some switches on DynamoDB, and it's a kind of auto-scaling thing. But we found it needed, for this use case, about four servers. So it's more economical than DynamoDB, and it's actually more than the simple queue service can handle. So while we built this one, we're thinking there's more things that we can do in VoltDB to manage queues than some special built queue service engine, and that was surprising to us. And so now we've turned our engineers loose on this, and they're like, well, there's, there's even more things we can do in VoltDB than we ever imagined. And that's very cool for our platform. It kind of validates our use of multiple databases and a selection of technologies. And VoltDB is proving itself to be very useful in more use cases than we thought. It just so happens that our aviation customer really loves us and has given us multiple ch chances at that. And so other than their fulfillment, we're doing their standard back end for frequent flyer miles. <clears throat> now, your real key here is that when you're dealing with a currency, you have to have real-time capability. Because imagine you're going into Starbucks with your frequent flyer card, and you're going to earn some points just buying a coffee. Now, if any of you have tried to do that and then go home the next day and look on the website and see if those points are there, you'd probably be disappointed. Or when you have an emergency and you want to fly quickly or you want to transfer some miles from one place to another, it's not acting like money. There's a batch process in the infrastructure of the frequent flyer industry that's not fast enough. So that was a prime opportunity for us, and we think it's going to actually change the industry. Uh, you, anybody who's familiar with the Ferengi rules of engagement knows when you let go of that dollar bill, the microsecond you perceive that it's out of your hands, it's out of your hands. And that makes sense. That's how human beings think about money. But sometimes the computer systems that are behind those transactions online are not that quick. They're not perceiving that. So that means there is a considerable risk for you as a frequent flyer provider for people to double spend, which is something you just can't have. And so the batch world for frequent flyer miles is now moving closer to the real-time world. This is going to start – this has already started on, 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 the, the, their, um, on our customers' website. And so what we did is, again, we didn't tear down the universe and build a new universe. We enhanced the one that they had. So we built microservices behind their website to accept the real-time uh, information that people were entering. And then we processed this in a, a, a double layer, as it were. So we're capturing those, uh, the earn and burn. We're keeping the balance for all of those customers and we're doing that in memory, and then we're supporting the normal process of a batch synchronization through the uh, IBM MQ streams that go back to the mainframe that they have been using uh, since, since day one. So we have an independent function that proves that we can do this in real time while still supporting the legacy process, and, and we had a, a, uh, a requirement to have this up for 14 days. So we can keep 14 days' worth of transactions in VoltDB, knowing that they're accurate in real time, and then go that with, with the backup system. Ultimately, they're going to, to cut over, or they may, not, they may decide that it's worth it to keep the old system, but we've proven that we can do this. And now other industry vendors may get the, the notion and see that anytime they're offering credit cards, uh, or the, 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 the stack of cards you see at the supermarket where everybody's offering a currency, the real-time ones are going to win and the batch 
are going to lose because people already think about money the way they do. So there's several lessons that we've learned in our experience working with VoteDB. The first is Java and SQL are commodity languages. So when you're working in languages that people understand and you're building new systems, it helps a whole lot more than if you're trying this new bleeding edge language that was just invented by Google. Okay? You're going to have a lower, lower total cost of ownership because you don't have to try to compete with the cool kids who actually want a job at Instagram or something like that. So even if you're outsourcing this eventually, there's going to be plenty of labor in the labor pool to understand these fast data applications. That's a big plus. Okay? That means your, 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 your system is going to stay around. Okay? It's an integrated system. Uh, you have to test all the edge cases for your platform and for your architecture, and if there's a weak link in the chain, well, then you have to read that error log. But since we put all of our fast data transactions and state stuff in VoteDB, we just have one log to read. So if something goes wrong, it's easy to isolate it, and we're not covering a, 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 a bucket list of, of multiple open source technologies to find out what went wrong. Absolutely rule, if we're talking currency transactions, requires ACID. There's a lot of people who are tempted to go with the NoSQL databases and all that stuff. There's really no need. I don't have to step outside of my area of, of expertise to handle those monstrous data flows. It's in SQL that I understand, okay? And you're going to have to have ACID or you're putting your currency at risk. VoltDB simplifies the endpoints. I can say this is a black box. This is what happens in VoltDB in my architecture, and that makes it clear, oh, this is front-end stuff, or this is data lake stuff, okay? Nicely for us, as analytic application people who are typically doing the data warehouse and sometimes the data lake or, or, or the presentation to the user, is we get upstream control. Now that we have VoltDB, we can say, hey, your transactions aren't, aren't as good as we would like them to be. Let's push those through real time and make those transactions, those atomic transactions, a little bit more rich. So now we can actually have metrics that make sense at the level that they're created. And, and that's a big problem with a lot of legacy transaction systems. People want to ask analytical questions of these things that, that doesn't have the actual atomic data generated for that purpose. And there was a lot of interpretation going on and a lot of windowing functions that you have to do in SQL to create this thing, which is a transaction that wasn't actually created in the original transaction system. So VoltDB gives us upstream control so we can say, hey, you know you built that stuff in, in, in Berkeley DB in the 90s, and that happens to be the fact with a lot of air traffic control systems and other legacy systems that are going to come towards the Internet of Things and, and this new stuff. So that gives us a lot of, of, of power and flexibility, and we like that. Now we think of streaming as something that can be transformed in real time. So it's not just the plain message. It's the message plus data that we can enrich on the way through to the end user. So we think of streaming now as something that is part of, of ETL. And, and, and the cool thing is our strategy has been for, from the beginning to do ELT, not to take the, the traditional e, uh, ETL vendors and then try to make them work in the cloud and try to make them work for larger workflows, but say anything we can do in the database, well, that's, that's going to be done a lot faster than because, you know, the development cycles on database are a lot harder than if you're an ETL, uh, ETL builder. So we, we trust the engineering of the database folks more than the ETL folks. And so now we have this tool, VoltDB, which is going to enhance our ability to do those huge parallel message processing streams, and we can do the transformations on them as, as needed on a going forward basis. Bottom line. VoltDB 
blazing performance. We, we don't even worry about scalability with VoltDB. We, we're, we're awesome fans of its ability to ingest massive amounts of data, and we love its interface where we can extend these Java classes and make it eat anything. And that works with our uh, producer and consumer model that we use for our data platform. So any, any, any set of transactions, any set of data that's going fast, any fire hose, we are confident in our ability to consume it. Having VoltDB clarifies our architecture. We know where the fast mission critical parts are, where decisions have to be made right away, where you can't afford to lose any data, where you just say, is it there or is it not? Who knew what and when? All right, that critical part of our infrastructure, we know, and we trust VoltDB to handle it. It redefines streaming, okay? Streaming is not just what your toaster is going to say. We can add the personality to the toaster if we need it. So we can add value to any streaming source, and that, that, that's wonderful for us as builders of analytic applications. So we're real happy to have VoltDB. It's, our experience is putting it more deeply embedded into our architecture, and uh, we're just looking forward to the challenges going forward as we grow this industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, boy, I wish you would tell us how you really feel about Vault. Uh, anyway, um, it's great to have it's great to have a partnership with uh, Full 360 and, and Vault DB. We we really admire the work that you guys have done in the data warehousing space and in the cloud space. We're we're looking to learn in that area ourselves, and we're happy that we provide some some great functionality to you and your customers in in this uh, pursuit for fast data. So thank you very much for that. Um, with that, I just wanted to remind you that you will be receiving uh, a copy of a Fast Data Strategy Guide, and by all means, let us know if it's useful for you. If you have any questions, if you want to explore any options, we'll be happy to bring uh, uh, Mike and, and Full360 into the conversation as well. Uh, you, they have some great experience in, that, in the uh, uh, customer retention space and satisfaction space with uh, the loyalty cards and so forth, uh, the gaming industry, a lot of the hot industries that we've been seeing hyper-personalization being really critical for. So well, we're happy to have those conversations. Just respond to the email. Let us know what you'd like to talk about. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter Vescuso for uh, Q&A. All right. Uh, thank you. Mike, thank you, Dennis. Uh, just before Q&A, just quickly, we'd love your feedback on the webinar. How helpful was this? Uh, just take a second, if you would, uh, give us your response. And then one one last question. Uh, what other topics are you interested in? Did you uh, learn what you were hoping to learn today, or, or are you looking for um, information on some other topics? If you wouldn't mind just giving us feedback on that, that would be terrific. Okay. And then question. We have a few questions. If you haven't typed in a question, use the Q&A chat window on your screen. Um, I think the first question is, is for Mike, but Mike and Dennis, you both might want to respond to this. Mike, you talked uh, in your first uh, use case example talking about gaming. You know, you, you said very directly this was not a batch um, um, approach that was going to work here. It had to be real time. So can you talk a little more about how you decide whether something should be batch versus real time and uh, versus being streamed? Sure. Um, for, for the gaming, it was, it was real easy. Uh, this was a free application, and if they want to push a notification of, well, are you ready to buy, you obviously don't do that after they've lost five games in a row. And so they just said, let's, let's find out if they're switching back and forth between games, which means they haven't decided really if, if, they're, if they want to do this, or if they're playing longer times. Uh, so this was something that they just absolutely needed to, to do because this was part of a feedback loop of back to their engineering of how, how w what do they want to build next. And so they were looking not only at session times, but at moves that the customers were making within the game. Uh, were they playing it quickly? And they, they kind of 
built an idea, a better idea of what their their their, their users were doing. Uh, but these guys were just really on top of everything, and that was that was the the, the reason why they wanted to do it real time. Yep. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, there's another question um, around VoltDB. Can VoltDB interact with other systems on AWS uh, through Amazon Lambda? We certainly run on AWS. All the examples Mike's talking about with VoltDB are through AWS. Uh, Dennis, maybe I'll ask you to respond to this. How would you use uh, VoltDB on Amazon, and would you use it with, with their in implementation of Lambda? Sure. Um, so we, we've actually helped uh, nu numerous customers uh, simplify and accelerate their Lambda. If you think about what VoltDB does, uh, well, if you're not familiar with Lambda, uh, it's, it's basically an architecture that has uh, two layers, uh, a fast real-time layer and then a batch deeper analytics layer uh, with a serving layer at the end that puts together the results of that. So you get the benefit of having deep, uh, deep uh, data scan analytics on the batch, and then you have the fast response, and, and hopefully they, they kind of equate and give you exactly what you need um, on immutable data. Um, so we've actually implemented and we've written about how to simplify the, the uh, Lambda architecture and, and get great benefit out of it because we have really fast ingesters and exporters. We actually just recently uh, introduced a, an Amazon Kinesis uh, uh, import feature so we can read right off of Kinesis and dump off on, onto Kinesis as well. We work with Kafka, RabbitMQ, and so forth. Um, I don't know of any customers who are using AWS Lambda itself, but we are work, we do work within AWS, and we, we support many of the uh, other capabilities of Amazon. So I'll have to check on the actual use with, with Amazon Lambda itself. Okay, great. Uh, another question around, uh, Mike, you're talking a lot about data warehouses. Um, does VoltDB uh, compete with or complement uh, HPE's Vertica? Can you, can you talk about that? I know you have some experience with Vertica. Yeah, we're an early uh, adopter of Vertica, and and we all we all pray at the statue of Stonebreaker, uh, knowing that he architected both of <laughs> these days of technology. Um, and 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 we do most of our analytic applications with Vertica, and then secondarily with uh, Redshift. So, in all of the cases that I talked about uh, for the aviation, we are running with Vertica as our analytic uh, database. So these are complementary, they solve different problems, and they work very well together. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, uh, VoltDB has worked very closely with Vertica. As a matter of fact, we have uh, common parentage, as, as uh, Mike alluded to, with Mike Stonebreaker. Um, and uh, so Vertica was the C-Store implementation, and, and VoltDB was the H-Store implementation that, that Mike Stonebreaker had in mind with his academic teams, and we've worked very closely with them. We have fast export to, to Vertica, as well as the ability to import back from Vertica. So as far as fast and, and big data, we have a, a complete solution working very tightly with Vertica, where we do the fast operation part of the Lambda. They can do the deep part of the analytics on, on Lambda, and then feed back uh, some, some tweaking into VoltDB to make our models even more accurate and make our analytics even, even faster and stronger and better. All right, thanks. This looks like the last question. Uh, we're talking a lot about streaming and uh, big data, so should have expected this. How does VoltDB compare to Spark and Spark streaming? Dennis, maybe you can take that. Yeah, so uh, Spark is an in-memory computational uh, platform, if you will. There's no persistence to Spark. You put memory in there. You, it's great for doing machine learning, things like that. We work very well with Spark. We have customers who have Spark as part of their stack. And we work as a fast front end, basically, to Spark, uh, being able to do that fast reaction and action and response to data as it flows in before it gets into Spark. So typically people are using Kafka, for example, as a, a, a queue to, to feed data into something like a Spark. Spark streaming is, is uh, uh, an addition to Spark uh, that does streaming really in micro-batching. Um, and we've, we've found that customers uh, aren't quite, our, our, our customers at least aren't, aren't uh, satisfied with the latencies that are involved with do, or the, just the, the computational platform of having to do micro-batching. They really do want real-time uh, streaming capabilities. So we, we like Spark. We, we don't necessarily see 
uh, a lot of competition with Spark Streaming. Those those customers tend to love the, the streaming capabilities of Vault DB. Okay, great. Thank you, Dennis. Well, that looks like it for Q&A. So I want to thank uh, Dennis and certainly Mike Bowen from Full360 for a terrific presentation. Mike, love those use case examples and, of course, your enthusiasm for VoltDB, and we share that enthusiasm for Full360. We've done a lot of work together with joint customers, and, and these guys are top-notch. So we uh, will say goodbye. Look forward to potentially having our, participa our uh, attendees attend webinars in the future. Thank you and goodbye.